Okay, now I'm going to give you an overview of a very important area for commercial transactions uh, called negotiable instruments. Now, first of all, don't be intimidated by the term negotiable instruments. These are simply special forms of contract which by statute, specifically the Uniform Commercial Code, Article 3, state statute, must meet certain standards to be substitutes for cash. So there are six requirements you'll see mentioned in your book. Uh, these include it has to be in writing, it has to be signed by the maker or drawer. Now those terms maker or drawer refer to different types of negotiable instruments. A maker is a person who makes a contract and promises to pay. So your student loan, your home loan, you're the maker, right? The payee is the bank who you got the loan from. Drawer uh, connotes a check or draft, a three-party instrument. Um, and in a three-party instrument, you're the drawer, the one who's withdrawing the money. The financial institution, the bank, is the drawee, and the payee is the person who's obviously it's going to be paid to. So uh, very important you understand these two basic types, uh, promises, uh, these two types of uh, instruments, these uh, 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 checks, uh, drafts, those are three-party instruments, uh, and uh, n notes, loans, uh, uh, etc. Those are two-party instruments. Now uh, there are also uh, promises to pay and orders to pay. So when you see on these instruments the the, uh, the words "pay to the order of," that's an order instrument, assuming there's a specific party named. So, you, but if you have a blank, if you sign a check and uh, have nobody's name in there, that's referred to as a bearer instrument. So. Understand those uh, terms. Bearer instruments are are the fuel for commercial transactions internationally. So be aware of that. The requirements discussed in your book. It's got to be uh, a unconditional promise, uh, etc. So um, and a, a specific amount of money. Uh, interest doesn't affect that. Think of it again. This is. Um, uh, the concept of negotiable instruments is actually a very old concept. Merchants, rather than carrying lots of money on them, try to figure out how to avoid uh, carrying a lot of money and be susceptible to being robbed. So they develop this, this uh, idea of negotiable instruments. They are intended to be a substitute for cash. In fact, if you look at a dollar bill, it's essentially a negotiable instrument signed by the uh, maker. Uh, it's a specific amount of money, unconditional, uh, et cetera. No, so think about the, these are all intended to be substitutes for cash. So you have uh, three-party instruments and two-party instruments. Important to understand the, the, the names of these parties because they have different liabilities. Obviously, if you want a maker on uh, your student loan or your home loan, you're primarily liable. If you have a co-signer, uh, that cosigner is, um, depending if it's a surety or a guarantor, which we'll discuss later on, they are also liable uh, for it. Um, the payee has a right to transfer that instrument to, a, um, to negotiate it, uh, and we talk about the concept of holder. Now, the holder is the party that is holding the actual instrument. And again, when I use the word instrument, I mean the contract, the check, the, the home loan, their student, the actual instrument, the party that holds it is called the holder. And the holder can enforce uh, uh, that instrument, um, presumptively. There, there may be some other conditions. Now, if so you have the original parties to the, to the agreement, to the loan. Those are the parties in privity. When that's transferred, that person who holds the instrument uh, is the holder. If that holder meets certain special conditions, like they paid value, they weren't aware of any you know, oddities or that it had been dishonored, whatever, that holder then can be considered what's called a holder in due course. Why is this important? Holder in due course is, has qualified immunity or is free from liability on some of the claims that the original parties in privity may have. 
So if, if we have a loan and I, I'm the bank, I lend you money, I, uh, I engaged in, uh, let's say, uh, some uh, uh, fraud or something, uh, and I sell your contract to a holder who is uh, uh, unaware that there was a breach of contract up front, let's say, uh, I, I sell you a boat, you need a boat. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, I, I agreed to take a contract from you where uh, you'll pay me so much a month, that's a loan, basically, uh, and I sell that to a bank. The bank pays me full value for it, not aware of anything odd. Let's say the boat I sold you um, is uh, a piece of junk, and uh, are you still obligated to pay on the loan? Yes, if, if it's with a holder in due course. So you'll see that there are what are called personal defenses, that are applicable only to pure holders, not to holders in due course. And then there are universal defenses which are ap applicable to any holder, whether it's a holder or a holder in due course. Now you transfer a, um, a, a negotiable instrument, check, uh, contract, uh, loan, uh, by negotiation. It's transferred by negotiation. Now it depends on the type of instrument involved, if, if it's a order instrument, if it's an instrument that says, as I, as I noted before, pay to the order of somebody, that person or that entity has to endorse it and then deliver it to uh, whoever they intend to uh, transfer that uh, instrument to and to benefit from the, uh, uh, the payment. Now, uh, there are various types of endorsements. You'll see this discussed in your book. One in particular I want you to pay attention to is uh, an endorsement uh, without reservation. Uh, and th these are qualified endorsements, very common in commercial transactions. And this is the idea that the endorsee is saying, yeah, I have a right to transfer the instrument, but I'm not guaranteeing the, the, uh, the debtor, the obligor is gonna pay on the thing. This goes back to why you need to understand the different parties and the names involved, because there are liabilities uh, for endorsing an instrument. Uh, and to, they're, they're, these are called endorsement liabilities. There are transfer liabilities as well. This is all discussed in your book. Um, so order instrument is, is negotiated by endorsement and delivery. A bearer instrument, this is one where you, can, you, you may have uh, on the check pay to the order of, but it's blank, or may say cash, or may say bearer, or even on a, negoti on, a, on a note, like a home loan, it may have a blank endorsement. Um, and you think, oh, that's, a, that's an error. No, that, what that is intended to do is to transform what began as an order instrument into a bearer instrument. So anybody that bears, that has possession of that instrument is entitled to enforce it. So those are called bearer instruments. These are critical. Uh, for international finance, this is, gets to how mortgages are bundled into mortgage-backed securities, etc. It's for ease of, ease, ease of negotiation. Remember, the idea of behind negotiable instruments is to have a substitute for cash, to make it as, as good as cash. And bearer instruments are, are, the, um, are the epitome of that. And, and you look at, look at a dollar bill, it's a bearer instrument, essentially. So there are these warranty and transfer liabilities uh, that you need to pay attention to in case there is a problem, like with the sale of the boat. If it ends up that the contract uh, that, uh, that you executed, uh, uh, it, there was some fraud involved there, uh, and the loan has been sold to a bank that uh, paid value, uh, didn't know about any uh, problem, you're still going to be liable on that. So, very important um, for you to understand this area, and this, and again, this is referred as commercial paper. Commercial paper. This makes the finance world go round.